delighted to be here, and uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Jim. And uh, uh, so I, I don't think I, I I just whizzed through Oslo, I think, 20 years ago or something. But, so that's uh, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to spend a few days here now. So. Uh, Here's what I want to talk about. I, I'm uh, going to talk with some about prejudices and biases, of course, because you know, the things that I have seen over the, over the uh, intervening years and uh, my uh, sort of thoughts about the future. Uh, and and in, in, the, in the context of uh, what we're doing now, I want to talk a little bit about some of the, I think, exciting things that uh, we, we are doing at Excel. Now, Excel was founded, oh, about uh, in, uh, seven or eight years ago by Oscar Mensa, who was a former student, and uh, it was based upon, uh, vaguely, upon the research that we were doing in Stanford in the late 90s, about 15 years ago, on multi-mode radios, and, of course, we'll be using uh, FPGAs to uh, uh, create the multi-mode radio. Oscar was uh, fascinated and uh, never lost his fascination with this. Of course, I told him, go to a thesis and do it on, on uh, I think, continued fraction arithmetic, because otherwise he'd still be there chipping away at uh, trying to solve the mysteries of uh, creating high-performance engines out of FPGA, which is really the topic that I'm going to at least address in, in the middle of the so, some history. There was a great debate in 1967 between, between two very famous figures in the field. One you probably uh, all recognize, Gene Amdahl, who was a colleague of mine at IBM at the time, and Dan Slotnick, a professor at the University of Illinois. Now, Slotnick was a, uh, the developer of the Iliac 4, one of the first great SIMD machines. Uh, and it was installed in 1972. And the debate basically brought out two, uh, uh, let's say, principles which they feel struggled with for the intervening years. And, uh, and of course, uh, things have changed over these periods of time, but let me tell you basically on those uh, arguments in this time, I think that the controversy was whether the field would go parallel or whether it would remain in this sequential mode. Okay. So Amdahl's uh, arguments, of course IBM's arguments, stay with IBM, don't change, and uh, we'll, that always could be today's, uh, up, up till recently, Intel's argument. Uh, serial processes will always win. There's too much time spent programming the parallel processes. Now his, Amdahl is more famous for his second law. So, and, and in fact, this is the first law is just really a restatement of Moore's law, uh, the old Moore's law where things get faster every 18 months by factor two. So just don't change those old Fortran programs. Just stay with them and put the, the, uh, uh, put the old card deck into the next generation and you'll be happy with the new performance. Now the second law, of course, he's most famous for, which basically says that a certain fraction of the program, uh, let's say 10% is serial, you can't go more than 10 times. You can't speed up the, the no matter how many, uh, how, how parallel the rest of the program is, or no matter how many processes you put it on, you can't get more than 10 times speed up. So, that's it. That's, this is, uh, let's say, in, in the current vernacular, this is known as Amdahl's law. Now, Slotnick's law was more subtle, or, uh, which really is a, uh, an acknowledgement of Amdahl's first law. This is, you, we could agree on this. And basically, uh, a parallel approach requires effort. If you really want speed up, you have to uh, look at the algorithm, uh, the analytics, the, the, the uh, data representation, the data structures, and be prepared to put in real programming effort if you want to get speed up. Now, he, he also notes, in an environment which has represented the absence of the need to think as the highest virtue, this is a decided disadvantage. Okay? Now, another way, more, uh, uh, let's say, a more kind way of putting this is programmer productivity. 
You want people to be able to finish the stupid program in, in, you know, in a reasonable period of time. So uh, the, the field has sort of evolved around this uh, pro program of productivity. And speed up has sometimes come at, uh, at was relegated to a, a secondary issue. So, and all was right. And with the field went serial or sequential. And Approach 
that we have uh, gone in hardware to multi-threaded superscalar cores with limited ILP, and most of the cache, uh, most of the uh, die doesn't do any computation at all. It just is uh, stages the computation with cache. And the cache it doesn't work for many server applications because they uh, they have large data structures and then they spill out of the cache. And sadly enough, I think, that most of what we've taught students about programming is probably useless for parallel uh, processes being up. Okay? Uh, layers of abstraction. Because, and the reason for this is it hides the underlying parallel structures. And you see, there are forms of parallelism. It's not just one thing. It's, it's which kind of parallelism do you want to adopt? And so it's very difficult to, at a very high level, say, I want to do a, a computation and you, the compiler, you figure it out. You, know, you, you do this. It's, uh, that becomes a bridge too far. And so, uh, and the more abstract, the less help you give the compiler, uh, the more difficult it is for the compiler to figure out how to really get speed up out of the, uh, the, uh, out of the underlying uh, parallel hardware. So, now, th these are the classic problems to deal with uh, multi-core parallel processing. There are really two that I'd like to, to mention here. One of them is memory, memory bandwidth. No matter how fast the processes are, if you share the memory, you've got to get the information out of the memory. And you have to get the instructions out. You have to get the data out. And uh, uh, you have to, so the faster you go, the more memory you need, more memory bandwidth you need. And the second point which I just made earlier was that the layers of abstraction hide these critical resources uh, and the ways of uh, dealing with the parallel, efficient parallel execution. So, now I'm going to talk about some things which we found effective. And uh, the, uh, basically, I, I put this under a rubric called multi-core FPGA convergence. And I'm going to describe, there are IC phases of convergence. And I'm really only in this lecture going to talk about the, the simplest phase, the, the first phase, where uh, so, so a multi-core server is uh, enhanced with uh, FPGA accelerator. And I'll talk about how and why that is, enables some significant speed up. Okay. Of course, I think you can imagine how, how uh, this step one here, how, how this could be extended uh, with having multiple types of accelerators. You wouldn't have to just have an FPJ, you would have some other types too, depending upon the type of problem. And finally, you need uh, reconfigurable resources of multiple types. You, you, can, you can generalize this, but I'm going to only really speak about uh, the, the first point. So I want to present you with a uh, more generalized and reconfigurable heterogeneous accel uh, accelerator model uh, and a cylindrical software model rather than, uh, more or less as a contrast, to the uh, layered model that you all know a lot <coughs> and teach everybody. Yeah. So, uh, now, here's the accelerator model. Uh, you have a host CPU and an FPGA accelerator. Now, you break the application into two parts. The essential part which is hopefully 99% of the dynamic activity, okay? And the rest of the application. So hopefully, even if you have a billion lines of code, you're only dealing with 10,000 lines, where all of the activity uh, occurs in very light applications, which is really the ones we're interested in because they're the ones that need to speed up, right? So, uh, the what we're going to do then is move the, this, only the essential part to the accelerator, and the bulk part remains just untouched in the, in the old uh, uh, representation, done in the old way. So, 
Slotnik's law of ethic, which we talked about earlier, only now applies to a small portion of the application. So now we're going to take this piece of the application and we're going to beat it up. We're really going to put a lot of effort into it. And that's how we're going to get the DXP up. Okay, so that's the, the plan. And this plan would work with any kind of accelerator, whether it's GPU or FPGA, from, from 100 yards away. This is going to be common to any kind of accelerator. And this is the way we're going to deal with Slotman's law of effort. We're going to restrict the portion of the code that we want to deal with. We're not going to rewrite everything. We're just going to take that uh, uh, essential part, and we're going to deal with that in this uh, robust way. So, here's the, what we would envision. This is now exactly what we, we do in Excel. We take the uh, host application and the host memory, and we put an accelerator card, or cards, it could be up to four of them, uh, through a PCI Express interface. And we have an accelerator. Uh, the accelerator is now a PGA uh, chip. Uh, with, uh, surrounded by memory. Now, the memory it becomes very important, as does the <coughs> FPGA, is now, as you well know, uh, has uh, hundreds of millions of, of uh, transistors and billions, uh, etc. You know, the, the numbers are incredible. And uh, the uh, size of the FPGA, unlike Moore's law for, for, for speed up, the, the uh, Moore's law for uh, density, transistor density, it keeps up. It, it still uh, it is operative. And so these FPGAs, which basically are a memory type uh, structure, uh, are very dense now, provide enormous uh, resources, transistors, uh, for the designer to use. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that essential part of the application, and we're going to create a data flow machine for that essential part, put it on the FPGAs. And I told you the other problem we had was memory. So we're going to take basically that memory you see on the bottom there, the host memory. What we're going to do is just use that for source data. And we're going to keep all intermediate results on the, uh, 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 on the accelerator with large amounts of buffer memory associated with the accelerator. So the accelerator is everything on this side of the PCI Express. And the, the server is uh, un untouched. It's the, uh, on, on the other side of the PCI Express. <clears throat> so, here's, the, here's the, the, the theory. Each essential program is a data flow graph. And the ideal hardware to execute the data flow graph is a data flow machine that exactly matches the data flow graph. We can get a compiler or a translator to form the data flow machine that it can be emulated by the FPGA. So we're going to create the ideal machine for <laughs> this particular essential part of the application. And then we're going to emulate it on an FPGA. And it will be ideal because we're going to put a lot of effort into it because Slotnick said we have to put a lot of effort into it. Uh, FPGA uh, accelerator, uh, accelerate, of course, called slow in cycle time, offer tremendous amounts of parallelism. Now, so there are some limitations. I mean, you can't do this if the dynamic part of the program was a million lines of code, because it, it, it's going to require effort. So generally, the order of five or ten, uh, say five or ten thousand lines of code, if the essential part doesn't exceed that, you can, you can do this. Uh, and only the control structure is matched. Not the data access balance. That, that's actually a separate talk, but we, we have uh, ways of what, what I'll call choreographing uh, the data flow into the accelerator from these, these uh, associated buffers that surround the, uh, the FPGA accelerator. I, I won't spend too much time on that. I'll just briefly mention it. So what we're going to do is accelerate with static synchronous streaming data flow machines. They're going to be static. We're going to unroll all loops. We're going to create, uh, in so far as possible, we're going to create, uh, mux up the, the branch paths. We're going to create them so that they're all the same length. And uh, the goal will, in, will be throughput, not latency. 
Although there are applications where we can also uh, handle latency. If you interpret the application in the, in the broadest sense, and I can talk briefly about that if you remind me a little bit later, how, how you get latency also. We're going to create a fully synchronous data flow machine, and it will be synchronized to, to we have six memory channels on the accelerator car. The time through the data flow machine is always the same. So we can actually, uh, let's say, simulate the, uh, the performance uh, long before we do a place and route and implement this on the, on the accelerator, and we know exactly uh, what we're doing and uh, what the performance will be, because everything is synchronized. There are no caches, there are no cache misses, there are no uh, uh, undetermined branches. We're going to stream the computations along this uh, long data flow machine, and since it all is all static, we're going to try to keep it as long as possible. Pipelines <coughs> 500 deep, we could have 2,000 operations going on every single cycle. And that's the way you get speed. And the next issue is dealing with the silicon area and the pin bend. So you, there's a lot of manipulation you have to do because you want to keep all of the pins busy and you want to use all of the silicon. You want to use, bring in new operands and put out the results uh, every single cycle. And you want to use up so all of the pins, as many as you possibly can. And you want to use, of course, all the silicon. So you're going to uh, iterate on this data flow machine. You're going to create this graph and you're going to look at it and you're going to say, ooh, well, maybe if I make it a little bit longer here, I can uh, get a bit, I can use, uh, uh, I can put another copy of the data flow of the machine on the same piece of silicon and I can get it to be even more double the speed up. I can keep doing this. And you're, you're trying to optimize the aspect ratio. At one end, you're, you're limited by the pins coming in and out, and the other, you're, you're limited by the area or the number of, uh, of nodes you can uh, realize in the data flow graph, uh, the amount of silicon you can use. So this is a, a visualization of what I've just said. A static, synchronous, streaming data flow machine. So, the data comes from the host node, memory, and it goes through these long pipelines, which are implemented on the FPGA. And the results, well, all intermediate results go, go to this uh, buffer. And, the, you know, we've done like a three-dimensional visualization, and you can imagine it going like this. The, the zero plane, the x, y results, are realized and they're put into the uh, intermediate buffer. When you form the uh, x1, y1 plane, you use the results uh, plus the input data to realize the, uh, the, the result from the, uh, uh, the uh, x1, y1 plane. But when you go to the uh, x2, y2 plane, you don't need the, z the zero uh, <coughs> plane anymore, so you write that out to memory and you bring in uh, the uh, X2 plane. And you keep building up this uh, cube until you have the three-dimensional rendering of the, uh, of the image. So in the end, you only brought in the data that you absolutely needed, the source uh, arguments, and you printed out or, or written out the final results. So here's our, our little machine that we, we sell to, uh, we, we installed it, and I'll tell you about some of the applications in a minute. Uh, but originally you're taking a, a server, a high-end server, one U a form factor, and you're just plugging in four uh, of these data flow engines, uh, four of these FPGA cards, with each one with uh, now 48 gigabytes of uh, DDR3 memory. And uh, the 12 is the on cores are just on the server. That's the original server. So when we talk about speed up, we're really comparing the server before and the server after these cards are added. This is a proprietary ring which inter interconnects the, the, uh, the FPGA cards so that you can uh, extend the data flow engine across the four cards. So the data flow machine, of course, for God. So you have plenty of silicon to work with and plenty of memory. But you have up to 192 gigabytes uh, of, uh, of RAM. And in this in, in, uh, uh, 
this version, there were 96 uh, gigabytes of uh, data flow at, at RAM. But I think we, we're moving to double that here shortly. And to connect one, uh, uh, one use server to the next, you can use InfiniBand. And there's another version of this which doesn't even have the, it, it, it's just a generalized version, where all the data flow engines or all the FPGA accelerators are in one, uh, one use server, and they use InfiniBand to connect to the uh, other servers in the uh, uh, ensemble. So from, again, a hundred yards away or so, the, the big picture is the, the contrast between traditional sequential processing, however fast it is, maybe you get two instructions per cycle and it's going at uh, uh, three gigabytes, and the contrast is the data flow engine. And the data flow engine, you, you could easily have, in fact, the, one of the applications which I'll talk about briefly in a moment, uh, has, uh, uh, I think, uh, close to 500 uh, stage pipeline, and there are four pipelines going on every single cycle, four, four identical pipelines. So you're pulling in all of this information, and you have 2,000 operands, uh, operations going on every single cycle, and the 2,000 operations, by the way, don't include loaded stores. They're all gone, no branches. So it's just the arithmetic operations that have to be done because that's what's defined by the data flow graph and the data flow engine. And even you're going a tenth the speed, it's the sheer amount of parallelism that you have available that gives you the, uh, the speed up. Now, this is uh, my view uh, of what the, uh, the effort, the software effort, uh, involves. Uh, you're no longer using layers. You're taking a small piece of the, or the, the hottest of the hotspots, and you're looking at what <laughs> algorithms are you using, what data types. And this is where, where we're dealing now with slot mix more of them. Uh, you're going to start and say, well, now, this is an FFT. Maybe I, FFT doesn't uh, uh, parallelize very, very easily. Maybe I could do this as a uh, uh, multi-dimensional convolution or something, which, by the way, it appears to be a, a poor choice because it goes up as, let's say, log squ rather n squared rather n log n. So you're putting more, uh, uh, doing more operations, but it parallelizes, and so you can get, you can use these 2,000 or more nodes every single cycle. So you want to first of all make choices at the very highest level. But at the same time, you want to go down right to the bottom and say, oh, wait a while, that's a, uh, a floating point operation. I don't have to use floating point there. I can use scale fixed point. I don't have to have 64-bit uh, uh, IEEE uh, floating point. This only needs uh, 37 bits or whatever else. Because it's an FPGA, of course, you can, if you individually define the nodes, you can, of course, save silicon. You're looking for saving silicon, and, and in the same process, as you change the operand uh, size or structure, you may also be saving pin bandwidth. Okay. So, you are doing all of these things, but for a small piece of code. And in my view, what you're doing then, once you have done this for the small piece of code, and you have beautiful acceleration, you've done it, then you extend your, the, the diameter of the cylinder including more and more uh, pieces of the essential part of the program until the program is accelerated. It doesn't happen overnight. Usually to do a good acceleration takes maybe two or three months uh, to, and, uh, and a lot of effort. And we have some very good tools to do it. So it doesn't come for free. It certainly uh, uh, validates uh, slot next law. So. And what we do, we use Java to create the data flow graph. No VHDL, please. And uh, so when we transform the application to execute multiple uh, data flow machines, if, if we can squeeze them on, you know, once you've done one, if you can squeeze on the second one or the third one onto the silicon, well, you get two or three times the speed up. And we're going to try to stream the computations through each pipe using what we call memory choreography. This is the, the memory controller, basically, is designed 
to take each one of these channels of, of this buffer memory and bring it in uh, in a synchronized way into the uh, data flow engine so that you, there's an operator brought in every single cycle, all of the time, and, and one written out every single cycle, all of, all of the time. The data flow machine size is limited by the FPGA area and the pin bandwidth. You can use application-specific precision, as I said, and to, especially to, uh, to optimize FPGA area and DRAM bandwidth. So I'll give you a little example here. We're going to bring in an operand every single cycle and divide by three to get the average. Okay? So first cycle an operand comes in and uh, on what's three levels down, two operands are added, and the third uh, level down, or the fourth level down, uh, the, uh, the the third operand is brought in, summed up, and on the uh, next to the last level, they're divided by three and written out. Now, of course, this has to be uh, synchronized, so there's buffers added, FIFO buffers, to make sure that the operands, are, proper operands, are arriving at the right time. And you can see them, uh, the, these two extra nodes which do the synchronization. So you have the data flow graph, and then you synchronize data flow graphs, so you have a data flow machine. And this can be done by the compiler. Now this is a real data flow graph. This is the kind that you, that the, the uh, the accelerator sees, you know, this is what he, uh, in a graphical form. This is an example of a, uh, a real application uh, where uh, each node, each point there, is basically a line of this Java code that you're going to see. And so you have to look at each one of these, this is why it's going to take you two or three months, and you're going to say, well, now with the floating point, with the fixed point, can, can I do better with this? And the, the compiler will also tell you how much silicon uh, that particular line of code is using. So uh, you're putting this all together, and then you're also asking the question, can I change the aspect ratio? Can I, can I make uh, better use of the pins coming in and out of this? Uh, is this too wide at a point, so I'll, I'll basically lengthen the pipeline? Uh, so you, you're going to ask a series of questions. Most of the time, uh, when code is generated, it's done to try to create the, the uh, shortest path through the data flow graph. But you're really not interested in the shortest path through. You're interested in keeping all of the res resources busy because you're trying to create a, 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 a compute environment where you're trying to get maximum use of the com uh, compute capacity of the accelerator. So there's a lot of trade-offs, the aspect ratio, uh, the, the number of pins coming in, whether or not you can put two or three of these side by side and get more speed up. And, but this is from, uh, uh, let's say, from, from a long distance away, this is what the, uh, the, the, the accelerating engine has to deal with. Yeah. Give you a little example from the seismic uh, world. Now, first of all, you have to ask, well, who wants all these stuff? Who's going to pay for it for you to do this? Well, there are people out there that do a lot of compute. And oil and gas exploration is one. Of course, it's well known here in Norway. I don't have to tell any group. If I was in Houston, it would be the same thing. No, huh? That's a, uh, it's an important application. Uh, so what happens is, at least on a sea-based survey, you're dragging 30,000 sensors behind the boats. And the sensors are, uh, you're, you're going to basically create a small uh, acoustic explosion every 10 seconds. And the boats keep moving along. And you're going to gather up the sensor data uh, every 10 seconds. And you're going to uh, do this all of the time. You're, you're constantly growing. So there's terabytes of data brought up each day. And then you have to create the image of what's underneath the seabed. Where is the oil? Okay, that's, that's the question. So, you can see the boat. Actually, these are, are like uh, a huge structure. You can see them in space. They're like uh, six kilometers by six kilometers. So there's 36 uh, square kilometers of, of, of sensors or these lines that are uh, being trailed along uh, the boat to uh, to, to capture all the sensor data. And then, down below, you find the gold, the, the, the black gold, the oil. 
Well, if, again, you, you get these strange looking images. I, I wouldn't know where the oil is, even if I had a, an ideal image, but some of the geophysicists think, oh, this is a beautiful picture here. Now, actually, it, it's another problem for, for these people is that you know, high frequency for them is 20 hertz. Okay? But if you want to go really get better images, you would like to go higher and higher in frequency. But the problem is, up to 70 hertz, say, but the problem is that the amount of air compute effort you need goes up as the fourth power of the frequency. So if you want to double the, the frequency, it's, it's the, that's two to the four. More, more compute you need. So, now here's a result uh, that we were able to publish with Chevron uh, in uh, Oh, this was from about uh, two or three years ago. Uh, so, and it was, you know, it's the same model. They had these servers, uh, the, the high, the best of the day, I think it was eight uh, cores. And uh, from the eight cores, you're getting about a four times speed up. Uh, because it's embarrassingly uh, parallel, but you still have memory congestion. So, compared to one processor, uh, uh, with a uh, one, this is a Vertex 5 uh, uh, card, uh, Max 2 card. Uh, you, you see the plot of the performance improvement by 240x. Or divide by 4 or so, and it's about 60x uh, box to box, you know, with and without the card. Same card, or same box, plug the card in, and it's uh, maybe 60 or 40 or something like that times faster. Now, the interesting thing about this card, the reason I like it is because it shows something. As the domain, remember this, this is a, a, a cube that you're looking at. And as its size increases, the, the speed up seems to increase. Well, the, 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 the uh, data flow machine is always going the same speed, so it's not being affected in any way. Uh, it's just going, it's taking on more and more data. But the, uh, the problem is, is what something I referred to earlier, the, the server compared to the, the, is falling out as a cache uh, uh, structure problems. These large data structures are really not well managed by the cache. And so that's why the speed up increases as the uh, domain size increases. So th these are some other uh, uh, results we have from uh, uh, various uh, applications, mostly scientific. Uh, 30, 30x, 25x, or whatever. And this is the box-to-box -box comparison. You know, the box just with the high-end server, or the box with the high-end server and the accelerator cars. The one, uh, J.P. Morgan is interesting because it's uh, financial derivatives. You know, you talk about uh, politically incorrect applications, and oil and gas is, isn't high on the list of politically correct things. <laughs> but uh, credit derivatives really isn't easy. So. I think the next thing we're going to look at is Las Vegas or something else. <laughs> but uh, we've also been, now this was an important application because it, it took them like overnight to create a, a model of the risk involved in these credit derivatives. And we were able to do it in minutes. So it was real time versus overnight. Oh, once, you know, the, 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 uh, once the customer sees that you can really do this, uh, they become believers. It's uh, no longer than a, uh, a matter of, uh, well, interesting scientific or research experiment. But now, we, this means money to us. And once it means money to them, then you have a, uh, a sold uh, customer. <coughs> so now, I, when I, I watched my, my uh, younger colleagues do all this, and I was uh, impressed, of course. But uh, I, I started to think about, wait a while. How can this be? How can we emulate? How can this emulation be better than a custom design? I mean, you know that the FPGA uh, area time power product is going to be a thousand times inferior to a custom design adder, for example. So how can this be? How can you get all the speed up out of an emulation? We all know you can't do emulations uh, at best uh, are going to be a, a tenth the speed. But here we are going 100 times faster. So, it really causes you to start to think. Now, wait a while. There, first of all, there's a problem with the multi-core approach and streaming. Uh, the multi-core lacks, 
you see, we haven't made this transition. We're going back to the 1967 argument, which way should the field go? Should it go parallel or serial? Well, the field already made that decision. It's gone serial. We don't have the, the tools now in place to really do, uh, to deal with large numbers of multi-core processors and get, and get uh, adequate speed, speed up. And the FPGAs are emulating exactly the ideal machine. They're not doing something, you know, uh, compromised, you know, they, they've gotten rid of the loads and stores, they got rid of all of the rest of this uh, uh, garbage or whatever else, and it's only doing the, the uh, realizing the ideal machine, and it's realizing only that machine optimized node for node for the computation. Success comes about because of their flexibility in matching the data flow graph with the data flow machine. Effort and tools, effort and tools provide the, uh, the speed up. Now what's ahead? So I talked about the past, I talked about what we're able to do and, uh, and how we're able to manage applications. I'd like to talk now, we'll speculate on the future. <coughs> well, the first speculation is just from the uh, ITRS 10-year projection. And it projects that we're going to see feature sizes down to 9.5 nanometers. And we're going to either have, instead of a, a billion transistors, we're going to have uh, 30, 20 billion, or 50 gigabytes of flash. So, no end. Now, what does that mean if we just stay with the traditional uh, FPGA model? Whew. Well, it pretends some. I mean, we, we just can't continue doing, you know, I, I, the, the scenario that I'm presenting just doesn't scale for 10 years. And there's a couple of, of reasons that we have to deal with, or probably have to deal with. Not the least of which is place and route, which is probably gone uh, has, has increased in, over the past 10 years by a factor of 10 for the larger die. It takes hours and hours now to do a uh, place and route. One would think that an ideal application for place and route is what? Acceleration. Wouldn't that be, make sense? So what do you think the, 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 the reason you can't do this? Any ideas? Well, the reason is that, at least when in talking to the, the vendors about it, is the code isn't stable. We have to have, you have, to have stable code. You, you can't do this thing, uh, acceleration for one piece of code. And then, oh, by the way, I want to change that. Oh, I don't know. No, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. Well, when you, you do that, you, you can't accelerate the code. That's one of the limitations of the effort you have to put into it. One would imagine that the, the vendors, the FPJ vendors, would be fascinated by uh, the, the possibilities of acceleration and actually providing the service for FPGA, for having their own little cloud for uh, a place and ground. But that's a discussion for another day. What about program? Well, again, if you just use VHDL, uh, the, I, I borrowed a slide from Evo Bolson's, uh, his, his talk at the FPGA uh, 2012, uh, a few months ago. And the next slide says it all. I mean, this is really his slide. Uh, I hope he's not watching when I, I, I didn't ask his permission. But uh, this is what his, and, and what he's projecting is that the effort to do a, an FPGA design okay, is, is approached in the same way as we do it today. And only we get 10 times the density of the FPGA. And we do everything the same. And we get a 60% design we use. And we would do this in 150 man years okay, to do the FPGA design. Oh, there aren't enough students out there to be able to do that, <laughs> even as an exercise. So we have to do something there. And this is what I'm, I'm uh, pushing here, is that sort of the Java-based data flow approach, or similar approaches. We need a, a, a broad spectrum of approaches. But this, clearly, we can't continue on the same path. And then there's three problems. <laughs> programming, programming, programming. I talked about the first two, but we need new thinking about parallels, <coughs> algorithms, data structures, analytics. This is again just repeating the, the argument that Slot is not well, let's say, not well remembered. He, he died tragically in, uh, in 2009. 
in the late 80s in, in an airplane accident in Urbana. But uh, he was a powerful force, and I think in, in the next uh, years ahead, decades ahead, he will be rem remembered as the, the seminal force in, in parallel processing. But this is what he says. So, now, I, I point to David May's law for software. Compared to the Moore's law we now have, David May. Software efficiency halves every 18 months. It's exactly compensating for Moore's law. <laughs> and his second law, which is certainly true, compiler technology doubles efficiency no faster than once a decade. Now, the, the second law I know myself in, in my uh, uh, you know, time, I watched, let's say, a little thing like general purpose registers coming in in 1963. <coughs> Register allocation wasn't really developed to a fine art until the late 80s. It took 20 years. To, Otherwise, you would have been better off just using those registers as accumulators. Uh, so, I know that these, and people, now the, the thing that really sort of, uh, I, I, I glaze over when I hear people talk, oh, we're, we have a new compiler technology which is going to solve all these parallel processor problems. It's uh, called Framus technology, you know, and we're going to do it, and if this compiler technology is different. It's going to take C++, it's magically a transformer into all this uh, parallel process, realizing the speed up. Uh, I don't think so. I, I agree with David May here. Now, it's interesting to, to think about Moore's law versus May's law. One is proactive. It tells the vendors, hey, if you, uh, if you want to keep up with the field, you ought to be down at 9 nanometers or 22 nanometers or whatever else. It pushes the field ahead. And each vendor says, oh my god, if I don't do this, I don't want to make this investment. I'm going to fall behind everybody else. So they move ahead. Uh, the software is a little bit different. Imagine if we had a software law. So compiler speed will double every 18 months. Well, I mean, you, I think most people are delighted if it works. If, if, if you get a program integrity rather than speed up. So speed up is not a well-defined metric, as every academic knows. I mean, how often do you read a paper where uh, that the, the uh, author has, especially the academic paper, the author has a little bunny and he puts a hundred bunnies there and he says, well, now I go 90 times faster than the one bunny. Well, that is the 90 uh, times speed up because you're comparing it only to within its own frame of reference. Speed up is really defined as the very best that sequential processor can do, the very best that parallel processor can do with different algorithms, you know, with different rethinking of the entire uh, system. So, you need this to, to keep in mind what the speed up really is. Now, we need a trans ultimately we need a transparent framework to integrate the dis disparate resources with different programming models. Yes, the sequential model is still valid. Yes, it's, it's still useful uh, for the host and to handle all of these exceptional conditions and a lot of the code. Multi-core shared memory. Accelerator based, data flow based, all of these are, are different models and they all have a place. And we need a, uh, a framework which, which we can integrate all of them in, in one uh, uh, defined uh, approach to, to the application. And, and with definite attention to speed up, not just to say, well, I got this thing to work. <laughs> hey, I got these accelerators to work and I got this to work and now it works. Well, how fast did it go? Oh, I didn't check that. See, so, it's, it's important to keep the, the, the speed up as a frame of reference in, in uh, all of this technology. Good look. Parallel processing demands the rethinking of algorithms, the programming approach, environment, and hardware. The success of the FPGA acceleration points to the really the weakness. Not, not so much, it's, it's, it is an emulation, remember, to the weakness of the evolutionary approach to parallel processing. The automation of acceleration is still early on. Tools, methodology, even the, the, the fabric is uh, the FPGA as we know it, uh, the way to go. And I think probably we're going to uh, make important strides in this fabric that we, we're talking about. We I don't want to lose the flexibility it, it, it offers, but surely uh, the fine-grained nature of the, uh, the, the technology uh, may be, uh, in fact, we wind up using all of or what the, the, the field calls the DSPs, which really multiply, accumulate. Why it gets the name DSP, I don't know, but uh, uh, 
we use them all, and uh, because they <coughs> offer a, an enormous uh, aid to the acceleration. So I, I see that the, the, this uh, hybrid, uh, you know, custom plus uh, fabric, uh, configurable fabric, as being an important uh, asset in moving ahead. In parallel processing, to find success, start with a problem, not with a solution. You know, uh, this was the way the field was a long time ago when I was uh, a young engineer. Uh, people would start by uh, going out to what in those days with the Atomic Energy Commission or wherever. They had the problems. And uh, the engineers would sit with the uh, scientists and try to really understand the, 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 the problems so you could put the right resources. You could mold the resources so they would serve the problem. And I, I think uh, even in the Maxeller case, we started basically with the customer and, and, its pro and, and, and that customer's problems. And I think that's one of the um, a fortunate things that we, we accomplished. You know, oftentimes, and, and, and this is now especially uh, endemic in uh, the, uh, the, you know, the whole field of computer architecture, which I'm uh, certainly an early advocate of. Uh, the, the, the problem is that the computer architect comes in with some uh, a new design. I have a design. Yeah. I'm thinking of a design, and it's going to be blue, and it's going to be this, and it's going to have that, and that. You guys figure it out. You program it. It's, it should be much faster. Okay. Rather than starting with the application and figuring out, what does the application do? No, I start with the answer. I have the answer. You guys figure out what the question is. So uh, that, that's a problem. And I think any, everyone that, anytime you read a paper, you know, saying, oh, here's a new, uh, new architecture, brand new architecture with this, this features, without referencing it to, you know, how did you get there? And, uh, on what basis? Or where did it come from? What application? What field? Uh, th th that's, that's a problem where the field has gotten a little confused. And there's a lot of research ahead. I mean, when you can, you, when you can go uh, orders of magnitude faster with the emulation technology, you know that uh, we still have a long way to go to understand what uh, a speed up and uh, uh, what possibilities lay in this, in, in this wonderful field that we're now, I, I have a little advertisement slide here that uh, my colleague uh, Oliver Pell gave me. And basically, he's going to talk late, later on to the third very vague line there on the bottom uh, uh, on Thursday at 11.30 about the program and how we program. So if you're all interested, please uh, go to that uh, talk and uh, you'll learn more about it. We also have a university program for those at the university uh, in, in jointly with Xilinx. So we, uh, Zionists give us these pieces for uh, free, basically, and we give them to you for the same price, but well, we have to charge for the, the framework and whatever else. So it's a very low-cost uh, way to uh, to find the fun of slot next wall, putting the effort in to get it speed up. If you want to really put, a, put it the, uh, uh, see how robust you can, uh, your speed ups can be, uh, you, you should talk to Oliver and he'll pull up. Okay, so uh, thank you, that's really on.
pro programmable, accessible to just uh, regular programmers, civilians, and not just uh, people with highly specialized training. And that's a good question because I, 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 I offer this more historically as what we've done. We have basically uh, uh, some tools now. And many of the uh, customers program their own systems now. They use uh, this uh, MaxJ, which is like a Java type of language. And so it's possible. I mean, it, Slot and law still applies. So if you really want to speed up, you have to put some effort into it. But uh, it's probably no more difficult than CUDA or other, other similar uh, approaches. So, uh, you know, I think we, we're to a point where we made progress. Uh, is it uh, really simple? No. But uh, it's, it's progress. And I think we're continuing to evolve the tools to, uh, to uh, make them more accessible. I think one, one important difference between sequential code and Rokida is that in those, in those scenarios you're targeting a fixed machine and you have an economic model that a programmer understands. I think mean, the challenge of FPGAs and spatial compute engines is, is you no longer have that constraint. You've got this empty canvas uh, that you can create any architecture and you no longer have a, a, a computational model on top of which... It's, it's, it's not an empty canvas, it's the application. It's the application. You're taking real code, and it's defi it defines the data flow graph, and the data flow graph defines the data flow machine. So uh, it's not empty. It's it's okay. there. It's the application. You know, if if you're telling me yes, it's like I'm thinking of a great machine, and you guys program it. Well, this is the great machine. Is the application? Yeah, in an FPGA, you build the you build the machine for your algorithm. That's, That's what's the difference between uh, computer and one more question, I think. And then, and then, and, and last question, yes, please.